Welcome to the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. The show covering all things health, wellness, culture, and more. The show for all of us who aren't old, we're better. Each week, we'll interview superstars, experts, and ordinary people doing extraordinary things, all related to this wonderful experience of getting better, not just older. Now, here's your host, the award-winning Paul Vogelzang. Welcome to another captivating episode on the Not Old Better Show Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. I'm Paul Vogelzang, and we are bringing you today another intriguing journey into the wonders of our world. Today, we're delving into the depths of the ocean, the ocean that is a realm teeming with mysteries and marvels. Today, we have the immense pleasure of hosting Smithsonian Associate Dana Stoff, a renowned marine biologist and celebrated author. Dana Stoff will be appearing at Smithsonian Associates coming up, so please check out our website for more information about Smithsonian Associate Dana Stoff. But we have Dana Stoff today, and Dana Stoff is passionate about the ocean. She began her love of the ocean at the tender age of 10 and has since blossomed into a lifelong quest to unravel the secrets of the deep. Her expertise, the enigmatic and extraordinary cephalopods, creatures like octopuses, squids, and cuttlefish, whose very existence challenges our understanding of life under the sea. These beings, these octopuses, the squids, the cuttlefish, they're not just fascinating, they are a testament to the incredible adaptability and intelligence of marine life. With their boneless bodies, their multiple hearts and brains, their ability to change color and shape, cephalopods are nature's shape shifters. But it's not just their physical attributes that are astonishing. Their problem-solving skills and curiosity mirror our own cognitive abilities. These creatures are just amazing, and they bridge a gap of over 500 million years of evolutionary divergence. In our time with Dana Staff, today we will explore all of that, including the evolution of these creatures. We're going to debunk some myths about them, and we're going to uncover the truth behind their nine brains and blue blood. We'll understand their pivotal role in marine ecosystems and even touch upon their influence in the realm of science fiction. So, Not Old Better Show audience here on the Smithsonian Associates series, please join us on this extraordinary journey as we dive into the depths of the cephalopod evolution and discover what these incredible creatures can teach us about life. These creatures and their intelligence, their mysteries, all in the natural world. So please stay tuned for an episode that promises to be as enlightening as it is enthralling. Dr. Danistoff, welcome to the program. It's really great to talk to you. I love this subject. I'm excited to get into it. Why don't we just start right there at the start? Tell us a little bit about your upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation, and in particular, how you're going to be using Zoom to engage our audience. We're all on Zoom these days, it seems. Absolutely. Well, I'm lucky because the animals that I'm going to be talking about are some of the most charismatic animals (laughs) on the planet, right? They are. They are. Uh So, yeah, I am going to be talking about how and why I fell in love with octopuses, squid, and their relatives. I mean, I've been obsessed with these guys for uh, about 30 years now, and I am still learning new things about them and just really enjoying sharing all of their incredible biology and the history of their time here on our planet and what their future might look like with anybody who will listen to me. Um, so I'll be, I'll be telling some really cool stories about these animals and sharing some beautiful images um, that I've been fortunate enough to have in my books because of working with photographers and artists. And, uh, and I do some silly little cartoons of my own, so I might put some comics in there too. <laughs> yes, I agree. Well, you mentioned that you'd been 
preoccupied since the age of 10 with octopuses. What drew you to these creatures initially? I definitely want to see that drawing because I think that's going to be an adorable one. We'll find it on your website and put links to it. But how has your perception of them evolved over the course of your career too? Absolutely. So um, from a young age, I was into nature. I was into animals. Um, and I was also into aliens. I really oh, liked the okay. idea that okay. there could be some just really weird life forms somewhere out there in the universe. And when I was about 10 years old, my family, I grew up in California, in Southern California, and my family took a road trip and we went to the Monterey Bay Aquarium in mm. Central California. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And oh, well. I ended up in front of the giant Pacific octopus. And I couldn't leave. I just stood there for like two hours watching this animal that had just sort of taken all of my interests and all of my fascinations and manifested them. It it looked like an alien. Um, I think this is something that continues to draw people to octopuses is just how different from us they are. They have no bones. They have tentacles, they have suction cups, they have squishy bodies that change color, and yet with how incredibly different they are, they have these eyes that look back at us, Mm. and this interest in their surroundings and this curiosity that really resonates with us. And so I think they're just this incredible encapsulation of what is different and what is familiar. And it does such a good job at engaging our fascination, engaging our empathy, um, and yeah, I just, I had to know more. And uh, and ever since then, I've been reading about them. I ended up going to graduate school and, and getting a graduate degree working on squid, which are relatives of octopuses mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Um, and equally fascinating in their own right. They, they really highlight another feature that this whole group has, which is the jet propulsion, um, which is another thing that very few animals move in this way. Um, it's something that we associate more with technology, honestly, but squid and octopuses octopuses and and their relatives all swim with jet propulsion. They're like undersea rockets. I love that. You know, it really does seem like they are just rockets. The propulsion is really uh, amazing. Well, I want to go back beyond 30 years. I want to go back 500 million years back to the time when cephalopods first appeared. How have they evolved from these shelled ancestors to literally these boneless wonders now that we see today. Oh, yeah. This is, there's so much here that's so fascinating um, to look at how long cephalopods, that's the group of mm-hmm. that includes octopuses and squid and, and nautiluses as well, how long they've been on the planet. Um, it really blew my mind uh, when I learned it twice as long as dinosaurs. So when the first dinosaurs started walking in the early Mesozoic and the Triassic, um, there had already been ancestors of octopuses and squid in the ocean for 250 million years. Wow. And it's just mind boggling to think that that group has been around that long. And of course they have changed tremendously in that time. Um, the very earliest ones going back, as you say, 500 million years, um, We have to remember, at that point, there was nothing on land, not just no dinosaurs, but no trees, no insects, nothing. All of life, pretty much, was happening in the ocean. And at the time, most of it was small. There were trilobites, there were clams, there were little snails, worms, lots of stuff like that. And the first really big animals on the planet, really the first animals that are that, are, that show up in the fossil record as what we think of as giants, like substantially bigger than our human body size, are cephalopods. And they're shelled. They have these big, long, straight shells like an ice cream cone. Mm. So if you can imagine like a squid stuffed into an ice cream cone as big as a bus. Mm-hmm. That's these early giant cephalopods. And they were probably swimming slowly. We don't know for sure if they were using jet propulsion. Um, it does seem likely because it's something that could have evolved in a fairly simple way by taking the the foot that they would have had when they evolved from something more like a snail crawling around on the seafloor to curl up that amount, that sort of part of the body, and use it as a funnel to squirt water out and propel their body in the other direction. So it's quite possible that that 
cephalopod innovation goes way back. But then it was over millions and millions of years that they evolved through having shells that were straight, eventually shells that were coiled in many different ways, and eventually into having no shells at all, that a lot of the other things that we think of as quintessentially cephalopod features, like the color-changing skin, mm -hmm. like the suction cups, like those eyes, mm -hmm. those things all came about quite a bit later. With their unique biology, which is truly unique, including, of all things, three hearts and then nine brains— Cephalopods almost seem like they are just from another world. Maybe explain some of these features and how that, the, the features, how that contributes to their survival and intelligence. Yeah, yeah, it's so cool. So the, um, the things that, it's funny, some of the things that seem super weird and alien about octopuses, I would say, like, are genuinely very weird, mm -hmm. um, like having suction cups. Okay, like obviously we do we do not have suction cups on our fingers <laughs> at all. Uh, so that's a really different sort of thing. But some of the things that seem alien about them are just sort of slightly changed from what we have. Um, when and you just have to change your perspective a little bit. So the hearts, for example, they have three hearts. It's true. But those three hearts are basically just like the four chambers of our own heart, hmm. slightly separated from each other. So we have one heart, but it is divided into four chambers to do different jobs. Um, we have two chambers that pump our blood to our lungs to get oxygenated, and then the other chambers pump that blood to the rest of our body. And so an octopus has the same division of labor, it's just also slightly divided into more distinct organs. They have two hearts that pump blood to their gills to get oxygenated, and then one central systemic heart that pumps blood to the rest of their body. So, you know, when I think about it like that, I'm like, oh, you yeah. know, they're just like yeah. us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but then you have the brains, you know, and I love this little factoid of octopuses have nine brains um, because it's true and it's not. It, it's all in what do you mean by a brain, which is one of the best things about octopuses, I think, is that they make us reevaluate our definitions. We say they're intelligent and then you have to say, what do you mean by intelligence? Mm -hmm. You know, we say they play and then what do we mean by play? All of these things, you know, we say that they're um they are sort of inspiring mothers because some a lot of the stories that get told about them are the female octopuses ending their lives, devoting mm -hmm. all of their energy to the care of their eggs. But then you have to ask, well, what does that mean? Is it motherhood in the same sense that we think of it? So they, they just make us reevaluate everything. And I love that. So to get back to the brains, though, where that comes from is that their nervous system, all of the, the nerves that make up that that part of their body is much more distributed than our own. We have a very distinct central nervous system in our brain. And then we have a lot of nerves going down our spine. We have our spinal cord and then we have more nerves sort of spread out. We like kind of like the branches of a tree from there. And now an octopus also has a pretty concentrated central nervous system in its head, which is the area right between its eyes. And that central nervous system is shaped like a donut because it has to go around the animal's esophagus. It actually swallows food right through the middle of its brain. Wow. Wow. It's just totally wild. And then it also has very large, what we, what scientists call ganglia, um, but which we can sort of casually think of as brains in the arms, really dense concentrations of lots and lots of neurons that are doing a lot of what we would think of as cognitive processing so that each arm can communicate not just with the brain and the head, but with the other arms. And what essentially is sort of take in information about the environment and make decisions about what to do and where to go. Mm -hmm. In addition to this unique biology, they have this really just as you cite, this unique intelligence. And in my research of you, I, I found that you often refer to this as curiosity, this problem-solving ability. How does that compare to other marine animals? And what does, it what does it tell us about the nature of intelligence itself? But yeah, so that is a really, really great question. So I had mentioned that, that we think of octopuses as intelligent, and then mm -hmm. that causes us to say, well, what do we mean by intelligence? Um, the thing is, the behaviors that they engage in that we recognize as intelligent tend to be problem solving. Um, in aquariums, um, people have given them all kinds of different puzzles, mazes, tests, and, and they're pretty much always food driven. So it's like mm -hmm. if you put a delicious crab or shrimp 
in a jar that they have to unscrew or uh, through a maze that they have to solve, which way do you go? They're really capable at solving those kinds of things. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting to me that I think makes us relate to them even more is that they're variable individual to individual, which means they have personalities. So a given octopus may be more or less food motivated than another one. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just their personality. They might be shyer or bolder faced with novel things in their environment. And that's something that scientists have noticed over and over again in doing these kinds of experiments. And another thing that they, that they do um, that I think is really neat is in the wild, and, and then also if you give them enough space in the laboratory, they have a den, they have a home that they will create for themselves or, or use an existing hole in the ground or space between rocks, and then they'll do some interior decorating and move rocks around, move shells around, dig, dig with their um, water jet in the sand to make it the shape they want. And then around that den, they'll have an area that they'll forage in, that they'll go out and look for food. And they have maps, like mental maps of that area, because they're able to find different things and then also find their way back to their den. And that's another thing that I think we find their behavior surprisingly relatable because that's basically how we live. Mm -hmm. Like most humans have a home and they've done some decorating to make it look the way they want. And they have their area that they tend to go out and they go to the grocery store and they go shopping and they have their friends that they visit and then they come home again. And I think that really brings home that there are animals that it's easier to study these things in. Um, Sorry about the okay. noise there. Yeah. Um, they're, they're animals that it's easier to study what we think of as intelligence in because they're more similar to us. Whereas something like a squid that's closely related to an octopus is very difficult to give these same kinds of tests to because their lifestyle is really different. They don't have a home den and they don't have a sort of flat area that they explore because they live, most species of squid live in the open ocean. And so they have this big three-dimensional space that they have to navigate and that they need to be able to move through and recognize lots of other species in and maybe members of their own species, whether they're a threat, whether they can be mated with. And so while in terms of their their nervous system and just anatomically looking at a squid, um, we would think it has probably similar capacities to an octopus, but it's incredibly difficult to get one into the laboratory and try to give it the same kind of puzzles and mazes. Hi, it's Paul. Do you love entertaining, informative, eclectic, insightful programs about culture, health, science, life, and everything Smithsonian? As part of our Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast, we're introducing you to the new Smithsonian Associates streaming series. Smithsonian, a nonprofit organization, is excited to present this new aspect of their 55 years as the world's largest museum-based educational program. Join us from the comfort of your home as we periodically interview Smithsonian Associate guest speakers. Our audience here on radio and podcast can explore our website for more information, links, and details at notold-better.com. Thanks, everybody. Our guest today is Dr. Dana Stoff. Dr. Dana Stoff is a Smithsonian Associate and will be appearing at Smithsonian Associates. Coming up, please check out the website for more details about Dr. Stoff, her upcoming presentation, her various books, and just some amazing pictures about cephalopods. Dr. Stoff is a marine biologist, a science communicator. We are so grateful for your time, Dr. Stoff. And I want to talk to you a little bit about the vital role that cephalopods play in marine ecosystems because they're, they're important in the food chain and they have this short lifespan. So tell us how all of that impacts their environment. You know, it's... It's interesting, they are in many ecosystems and many species of octopuses and squid really central to a lot of food webs. Um, it means they're not at the top. They are almost all predators, which means that they are actively hunting, catching, eating prey, eating smaller animals than them. Um, but they're also prey. And they are really good prey if you can get it mm. because an octopus or a squid is like, it's like a swimming protein bar. Mm. It's almost nothing but muscle, um, a lot less bony than a fish. Um, 
And you don't have to pry it out of a shell like a clam or a snail. And so pretty much any large enough predator will absolutely go after octopus and squid. And so that's all your marine mammals, pretty much, except for the ones that are that focus on plankton. So like toothed whales, dolphins, seals, sea lions, otters, um, and then all of your big fish. So sharks, uh, tuna, um, eels, moray eels love to eat octopuses, and then also animals that you wouldn't even suspect, like seabirds. Albatrosses love squid. Um, in fact, squid make up the majority of their diet. And even animals on land, if they can get them. So there are cases of bears and wolves coming down to the seashore and eating squid that's stranded on the seashore. Yeah. So they are really an important food source for pretty much every reasonably sized predator, including each other, because they're not picky carnivores. So they will absolutely eat, squid will eat other squid, even members of their own species, if it's small and easy to grab. And then they also tend to be pretty generalist predators. So they're eating in addition to members of their own species sometimes, um, lots of shellfish, lots of smaller fish. They'll absolutely eat plenty of vertebrates. Um, they'll eat small sharks uh, and along with all kinds of stuff that lives on the bottom, snails, clams, crabs, you name it. Are so they, they're really making a lot of connections, ecologically speaking. Thank you. I, I apologize for, for interrupting. I, I just wanted to ask real quickly, uh, are they threatened in, in the wild? Do we need to be worried about efforts of conservation on their behalf? This is a really good question that I get a lot. Um, yeah. And it's it varies by species, you know, and it varies by ecosystem. Um, so I think conservation is a really complicated topic. Uh, there are systems that are really vulnerable, like coral reefs. Um, many people have probably heard about how vulnerable they are to the mm -hmm. combination of climate change and pollution. And there are octopuses that live on and depend on coral reefs. And so those individuals will be at risk if their habitat becomes less tenable, less available. Um, but as a general thing, um, something that I think is really interesting about this group is that their short lifespan, which we mentioned, so most of the most octopuses and squid live for a year, some of them less than a year, even the really big ones, usually only two or three years at most. Um, that short lifespan and the fact that they have lots and lots and lots of babies makes them a really flexible group. And so they have a lot of capacity to adapt to a changing environment, as well as their ability to move. So again, unlike a coral or even a snail, they have a lot more capacity to move from one environment to another if they are not finding the food they need, if they're not finding the resources they need. And there are a lot of cases where they've been observed doing that, where squid have been observed to change their migratory patterns, um, where they've adapted to finding different prey. So, and like no animal is so adaptable that it is at no risk of losing what it needs. But it is interesting that this is a pretty flexible group, both literally when you see them waving their arms around mm -hmm. and in that metaphorical sense of what their life history strategy and their ecology makes them capable of. <laughs> you do make this great point right at the outset about cephalopods being almost aliens. And, and so I wondered... It, it, what about the science fiction stories? Because there are aspects of their biology, their behavior that just make them perfect candidates for these fantastical tales. It, it really gets back, interestingly, to what I was saying at the beginning of our interview, that I was so into aliens. <laughs> and then when I saw octopuses, I was like, oh, it's like aliens on planet Earth. And just to be clear, they are not actually extraterrestrials who came to Earth. Like, we know how octopuses and their relatives evolved. We have amazing fossil evidence and DNA evidence to show how they're connected to all the rest of us earthlings. But they're alien in the sense of just feeling very other. And I think that makes them just such a great template for authors of fiction, artists of fictional extraterrestrials to draw from. Um, and one of the things that we have to remember is that every extraterrestrial that you might call up visually into mind when you think of aliens, it's fictional, right? Because we've still never actually found life on other planets. So all of those visuals we have are made up by humans, inspired by things that we have thought about and seen. And there's really nothing like 
an octopus <laughs> to inspire what could life look like if it's different? What if it had no bones? What if it had suction cups? What if it could change color? I mean, there's such a, a rich mine of different ways for life to be. And, uh, and, and to get to the giant squid, I think that's another really appealing thing about this group is that ever since nearly the beginning of their evolution, they've been producing individual species that get really, really big. So not all of the early cephalopods were the size of a school bus, mm -hmm. but some of them were. Mm -hmm. And today, most cephalopods are small. A lot of octopus species are smaller than the palm of your hand. But then there's the giant Pacific octopus um, that's arm span is way bigger than any human arm span. And yes, there is the giant squid. There's also the colossal squid. Those are two different species that both get very, very large um, and are real and live in the oceans around the world. Um, the actual real size of them, I always point out that the main body or the mantle that includes a uh, the chunk of body that has all of their organs in it, that's what on a small squid gets cut up into calamari rings. That is on these really big squid on the order of eight to nine feet, mm. roughly. It's really big. It's taller than a human. But if you think of numbers that you might have heard, like 40 feet long or 50 feet long, those numbers come from measuring not the main body of the animal, but the body plus the tentacles, which are a little bit elastic and can, <coughs> excuse me, the tentacles can be stretched out super, super long. So if a dead giant squid washes up on the beach and somebody takes the tentacles and marches them out as long as they'll go on the beach, then yes, they could get numbers like 40 feet long. But it's not like the bulk of the squid is that big. Thank you again so much for your, your generous time today, Dr. Stoff. We, we really appreciate it. I'll tell you this, too. Your upcoming presentation is just going to be wonderful. So many in our audience just enjoy science. And in addition to your presentation, where else might we go to learn more about marine biology? Many want to discover this passion. We're surrounded here locally by great aquariums and other resources. But what do you suggest? Oh, that's a great question. There's so many good sources. I mean, I think that um, one of the really cool things about social media is that a lot of scientists and science writers and science communicators really use them very well. And so just two examples that come to mind are um, a scientist who posts beautiful photos as well as accurate scientific facts about octopuses on Instagram and Facebook. Um, and she goes by the octopus girl mm -hmm. um, and she's doing active research on octopuses and um, just sharing that with the world. Lots and lots of people um, are learning a lot from her work. And then there's also um, what uh, the uh, sort of the squidly counter counterpart, Sarah McAnulty, is, um, drives a car called the Squidmobile and she runs Squid Facts Hotline so that if you text that number, she'll text you back a squid fact. Um, and, and so those are just two examples. There's a lot more people as well that are knowledgeable about science, that are sharing accurate and entertaining information online. And then for people who want to dive even deeper mm – -hmm pun illusion intended. <laughs> yeah, of um, course. <laughs> there, it depends a lot sort of geographically on where you are, mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of cool opportunities. A lot of aquariums have volunteer programs. Um, there's even, uh, if you live near a coast, there's often opportunity to get involved with interpretive programs at beaches and tide pools. Um, so yeah, I think that the, the love for the oceans is just a beautiful thing to see all around the world that I think more and more people recognize how dependent we all are on those massive bodies of water that might not be where we live, but are still connected to our lives. Dr. Dana Stoff, thanks so much for your generous time today. Thanks, too, for your research, all your great work, and your passion for this wonderful subject of cephalopods. We are excited about your upcoming Smithsonian Associates presentation. Please check out our website for more details about Dr. Dana Stoff's presentation coming up and all of the many links that she's shared but to share thank with everybody. You so much. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Stoff. My thanks to our guest today, Smithsonian Associate Dana Stoff. Dana Stoff will be appearing at Smithsonian Associates coming up, so please check out our website for more information.
My thanks to the Smithsonian team for all they do to support the show. My thanks to you, our wonderful audience here on radio and podcast. Please be well, be safe, and let's talk about better. The Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. Thanks, everybody. We will see you next week. Thanks for joining us this week on the Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on radio and podcast. To find out more about all of today's stories or to view our extensive back catalog of previous shows, simply visit notold-better.com. Join us again next time as we deep dive into some of the most fascinating real-life stories from across the world, all focused on this wonderful experience of getting better, not just older. Let's talk about better. The Not Old Better Show, Smithsonian Associates interview series on community radio.